Welcome to our virtual worship service for Palm West Community Church for May 3rd, 2020. This is the first Sunday of the month, and on the first Sundays we celebrate communion as a congregation. And so I invite you to uh, get some juice together, some wine, some bread, some cracker, whatever is meaningful for you to celebrate communion. And you can pause this video to go get that, and the, later in the service, we'll be having communion together. To the saint and the sinner, welcome. To the confident and confused, welcome. To the bruised and the broken, welcome. To the believer and the doubter, welcome. You are not viewing right now by accident. God wants you present in your place at this time. So here you are. This is a gathering of God's family, no matter where you are, birthed not because of age or economic status or color of skin or political point of view, but formed by the hammering of nails into a wooden cross. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let's sing together a song of praise, great, is the Lord. Great is the Lord, He is holy and just. By His power we trust in His love. Great is the Lord, He is faithful and true. By His mercy He proves He is love. This morning, as we come into our pastoral prayer, I want to read for you, read over you a couple verses that I encountered last evening in my own time in Scripture that I thought would be perfect for us right now. Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30 goes on to say, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As we look at those challenges that are before us as a church family, the challenges that are before you individually, you have to know that if you are a follower of Jesus, that no matter the size of your challenges, that Jesus offers a rest. A rest for your soul, a peace, a comfort that comes from knowing that he's got you, that you are in his hands. If you are receiving our regular prayer and updates email, I invite you as always to spend time with the requests that we've listed out for you on that email in your own prayer time those in our church family that are experiencing health concerns, those who can't get out and are homebound, those who are in the final chapters of this life and are under hospice care, those who have recently lost loved dear ones, 
And then a growing list of people, people who are connected to our our Palm West congregation. Those in our extended family who are experiencing health issues. And with the coronavirus, honestly, that list has been getting longer and longer. Please be praying for all of these on your own during the week. But let's take time right now to bring our requests to God. Please join me as we pray. Father, for the challenges, the concerns, the situations that impact our church family and beyond, for those situations that we know about, the situations that we don't know about, we pray for all of it. We pray for those impacted by those situations and we trust in you. Bring healing and peace and comfort where it's needed, Father. Bring provision, bring wisdom, bring clarity. Guide doctors and caregivers and nurses and technicians. Give them strength and skill. For the families of those navigating the health challenges of a loved one, Father, give them understanding and insight and patience, endurance, and love. For our health concerns, our physical challenges, Father, we pray for your touch. Into each of these situations, Father, we pray for your supernatural healing. For our country and our world, our state and our community in the grip of this pandemic. As we look to turn a corner and begin to reopen in the the upcoming months, Father, guide those in charge. Protect our frontline care providers. We pray right now for those searching for a vaccine, a therapy to, to combat the coronavirus. I pray for those who have lost jobs, who have lost incomes. I pray for those who have lost loved ones. And for all of this, Father, through all of this, allow us to see you more clearly. Your love for us, your care for us, your presence with us, and the rest that only you offer to us through your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley, in darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, Some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day.
Though sorrows befall us and Satan oppose, God leads his dear children alone. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children alone. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Away from the mire and away from the clay, God leads his dear children along. Away up in glory, eternity's day, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through his blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. In the night season and all the day. Well, good morning, everyone, and God bless you. Thank you for joining us here at Palm West Community Church as we continue our series, The Silver Lining. I want to remind you, if you are members and regular attenders, to continue to support the church generously as you have means. We would appreciate that. Uh, those of you that are joining with us online, we're just very thankful to have you with us. Um, just to give a brief update on where we are in the uh, process of reopening, uh, this week our governor made a pretty extensive um, press conference. It looks like uh, they have extending the uh, stay-at-home order through the middle of May, and even when they begin to open the state up, they do not want to have gatherings, larger gatherings. So uh, it's probably going to be sometime in June before we're able to open, perhaps the end of May, but probably sometime the month of June is what we're looking at, assuming that things go well. And we uh, are working right now to put together some guidelines on seating capacity, how we're going to be able to handle that. Uh, and we'll be letting you know all those expectations in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the good news is that by God's grace, we had budgeted some money this year to be able to purchase video equipment, and so we're getting all of that installed right now. We have a wonderful team of people. Uh, Pastor Peter Kine, Doug Totel, Jerry Norman have done a great job of putting together these videos for you, and we are going to be in a position uh, when we begin to meet again to be able to continue videotaping our services for those of you who are not in the area or those of you who do not feel comfortable uh, actually coming to physically worship with us. So we're very blessed in that sense, and we're very thankful for our volunteers volunteers and for the church's generosity that's allowed us to do this recording and will allow us to continue recording after uh, we begin to meet again. So continue to stay safe and keep us in your prayers as we keep you in your prayers, uh, keep you in our prayers. Well, today we continue our sermon series entitled The Silver Lining. And what we're doing is we're talking about the fact that sometimes things come into life that are not ideal, things that we're not necessarily excited about or don't want to have to walk through. But in the midst of those challenging circumstances, God is always working for good. And there are certain things that God says to us that actually is a positive, is a blessing in the midst of the, the difficulty. There is a silver lining inside the clouds. And so today, we come to the subject of God's power. 
that when we have to go through difficult circumstances, sometimes we just don't feel that we have the umph, the energy, the juice to be able to continue to endure. Sometimes it can be physical limitations. Sometimes our emotional well-being or our, 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 our souls, our spirits are so beat up, we just don't feel that we have what it takes to continue to move forward. But the Lord tells us that his power, the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead is still at work in and through our lives through the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, we have a passage, a beautiful passage of scripture that really speaks to this idea of God's ability to strengthen and to empower his people in times of weakness and times of fatigue. The passage is found in the book of Isaiah chapter number 40. And let me read it, and then we're gonna sort of walk through it verse by verse, and then I have a couple of applications at the end. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27 through 31. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak, and even youths shall grow weary and tired, and young men will stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. What a beautiful passage of scripture from the book of Isaiah. This is written in the context of, of Isaiah speaking to the people, offering hope, offering comfort to the people. There's been a lot of turmoil in Israel. Isaiah writes about a time when, when Sennacherib, the Assyrians, have come and conquered the northern kingdom. There's a threat of the possibility the Babylonians, uh, 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 Hezekiah has been able to stand firm even though the city was under siege and they've been able to endure this very difficult time, but the people are still very, very unsettled emotionally. And Isaiah writes this chapter as a means of giving hope and giving comfort. And he says, listen, God can strengthen you through his power. It begins in verse number 27 and 28 where we really begin to see the souls of the people. We begin to see their frustrations. It says, why do you complain, Jacob? The people are sharing a lament, and this is nothing new in the Old Testament. Almost one third of the Psalms, 42 of them, are considered laments where people are either grieving or they're questioning God. How long, O Lord, how long? Why are you not intervening? Why are the, are the wicked prospering and the righteous suffering? These kind of prayers are normative in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, and here, uh, Isaiah questions the people. He says, why are you complaining? And why do you say specifically, our way is hidden from the Lord? This word hidden here, sather, means to be concealed. It speaks, it's often used in the context in the Old Testament of, um, of adultery, where people are having intimate relationships and they're doing so in a hidden manner. They're trying to do it secretively so no one can find out. The people are questioning, they say, God, why is our way hidden? Why do you do not see what we are going through? If you were with us last week and you heard the message where I talked about God's provisions, we talked about provisions, comes from the word provide, which speaks of, the, of foresight or foreknowledge. And we shared in great detail how God sees ahead. God sees our life. He sees our path. And God doesn't just see ahead passively, but God sees ahead and he interacts, often working, maneuvering to be able to work for good in the midst of those situations. But here the Israelites were questioning God's providence. They were questioning God's uh, ability to provide for them. They believed that God's, uh, that their way was hidden from God, that it was in secret, that God was not able to see what they were going through. And then it says, it says, uh, why uh, do you question, why is my way hidden from the Lord and my cause is disregarded by my God? Now this word disregarded, this word right here is a beautiful, beautiful word. It's, it speaks about the idea of, of crossing over a creek or a river. It means to pass over or to pass through or to travel through someplace. And so what they're basically saying here is they're not questioning God's existence because they say our way is disregarded by my God. They're acknowledging God's existence. They're acknowledging that God has been present, but they believe in this circumstance that God is just passing right by, that he's completely disregarding, that he's, he's basically neglecting them. He's basically just completely ignoring them, almost like, the way that you and I sometimes are able to drive by a homeless person. 
You may see the person in the corner of your eyes, but you drive by or maybe you stop at the light and you don't turn your head. We don't make eye contact sometimes. We don't say hello or, or wave or offer them a gift. We simply just sort of almost act as though they aren't there. And then we drive on down the road going about our way. This is how the people felt about God. They felt that the Lord had disregarded them, that God had sort of ignored them, that he was just moving by, doing his thing, and they were left, and their way was hidden. God did not see what they were going through. But in the midst of this, Isaiah reminds them that God is very much at work. Because the part of their lament is coming out of the fact that they are beat up, they are fatigued, they are frail. We read these words in this passage. We read weary two different times. They are exhausted. They are weak. They are tired. They are stumbling. It says that even youth shall fall. The idea here is that they literally collapse out of fatigue. And then Isaiah says that even young people, even these that are a picture of vigor, a picture of energy, a picture of stamina and passion, even the youth shall grow weary and they shall faint. They shall collapse because of weakness. The people here are tired, and because they're tired and they're wore out emotionally and physically, they are beginning to question God. You know, there are very few of us that are living our best when we are tired. I know I often say, when I'm tired, I'm not a very good Christian. <laughs> because when I'm tired, just like I imagine you, I am, I'm not nearly as patient with people. I have a shorter temper. I become irritated. My words can become sharper and more, more uh, critical of other people and other things. Um, I can become angry easier. When we become fatigued and tired, it's hard for us to maintain perspective. The people here are tired. They are weary. They are weak. They are beat up. And because of that, they are questioning God's involvement and God's goodness in their life. But Isaiah gives them a promise, an important promise. He says in verse number 28, do you not know? Now this is almost a, a sense of condescending, a sense of, of um, almost a rhetorical question. Do you not know? Have you not heard? They hadn't heard. They did know, but they had forgotten or their circumstances were so overwhelming they began to question it. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. Listen to these four characteristics he says here. The Lord is the everlasting God. Right. El Alom in the Hebrew, one of the 16 names given for God. He is everlasting. He was, he is, he forever will be. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God has made all of this. The fourth characteristic, he does not grow tired or weary. Now this is interesting because he's going to use these same two words, tired and weary, the exact same words in the Hebrew to describe the fact that we as humans, we do get tired and weary. Even youths grow tired and weary, but God does not grow tired and weary. And his understanding, his divine understanding, no one can fathom. We do not fully understand God. So once he get, paints this picture of the Lord, and while the people are complaining and they are fatigued and they are frustrated, he says, don't you know, have you not heard? This is who God is. He's everlasting. He is the creator. He does not grow tired or weary. And his understanding, his ways, no one can fully know. But this God is able to strengthen you. In verse 31, it says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will walk and not grow weary. They will... Um, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. And notice these two words here. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. The word hope here is significant because it speaks about waiting for something. I actually think waiting is a better translation. It probably should say those who wait on the Lord as opposed to those who hope in the Lord because the word really does speak about waiting for something with anticipation. It's used in the biblical account to talk about people who are waiting in ambush. They're waiting for someone to come that they can be able to ambush or to jump on. It's looking forward. In the book of Job, it says in chapter 7, verse number 2, like a slave who longs for the evening shadows and a laborer who waits to be paid. That's the word here. Think about someone who's working hard. They're, they're waiting to be paid. They're hoping to get that, right? They're this, but this idea is they're waiting with anticipation. Like, think about a slave, Job, Job says, a slave who longs, who's waiting for the evening shadows. They're working hard. I can't wait for the sun to go down so I can be able to rest. 
You know, in our country, after the shutdown occurred in March, we had 26 million people in five weeks applied for unemployment. I saw a story in the USA Today um, where uh, a person was sharing that they had called the unemployment office in their state and they were said, you are waiting in line. There's a significantly longer wait and their number was 88,000 and something. Think about that. They were queued up. 88,000 people were in line in front of them waiting to find out about their unemployment benefits. Now I share that to share this. Those people in our country who have lost their job the last five or six weeks, they are waiting. They are hoping. And they're not passively waiting, but they are longing. They're anticipating, when am I going to be able to get my unemployment from the government to be able to help me get through this very difficult time? This is the essence of the word here. Those who wait, those who hope in the Lord, not this passivity, but those who are longing uh, for the Lord, they will renew their strength. The word renew means to change, to exchange, to replace. After David's child died in the book of uh, 1 Samuel, the Bible says that David uh, got cleaned up, uh, that he anointed himself and he changed his clothes and the people saw the change in his countenance. All right. It speaks about this idea of completely replacing something. So what he does here is Isaiah says, those who wait upon the Lord, God will strengthen you. He will renew your strength. He will give you a power to be able to get through whatever it is that you have to get through. He will give you strength beyond your own strength. And then he gives these three beautiful word pictures that we need to look at. He says, they will soar like eagles. Now, eagles are a beautiful, majestic animal when they're soaring in the air. And by the way, when they soar, they do so effortlessly. They're able to catch the, the wave, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, air patterns. They're able just to open their wings. You realize that most birds cannot soar. They have to work. They have to flap their wings to be able to fly. But eagles, like a few others, are able to open their wings. They're able to, to, to soar with little or no effort. They're able to cover great amounts of, of, uh, of, of, of traveling. And they're able to do very, very move at a very, very fast pace with grace and with splendor. When God's, by God's grace, we're able to soar, life comes together rather effortlessly. Our relationships, our finances, our career, our body, it just seems as though things are clicking and moving with little or no effort. This life is in very, 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 very good and moving very, very well. Isaiah said, sometimes God will strengthen us and we will soar like eagles. But other times he says, we will run and not grow weary. Now, when you run, you do not cover as much ground as when you soar. Running also requires effort. You have to put something into it to get something out of it. But when you run, the Bible says, or not the Bible, but, but basic physiology says our body produces endorphins. And oftentimes people experience what's called a runner's high. When you run, you're still moving forward at a faster pace. You're able to get things accomplished and there's often a reward for that. He says that some of you, when God strengthens you, you are going to soar like eagles to places you didn't know about. Others, you're going to run, but even when you run and you're exerting energy, you're not going to grow weary. And then he says, you will also walk and not faint. Now, walking is just walking. It's not running. It's not soaring. It's a much slower pace. It's not overly exciting. But you know what? There are a lot of people that would love to walk without limitations. Walking is one of these things that we take for granted. And he says that some of you will walk and you will not faint. You will not collapse. You will not fall. I remember several years ago when I had a knee surgery and I was down and I had to get up and I wanted to get something. And I was, uh, had some pain in my leg and I was on medication. I remember getting up <clears throat> with my crutches and just the unsteadiness, the nervous about saying, can I get from here to there? Just get across the room without falling. Isaiah says, you know what? When God strengthens us, some of you are going to soar like eagles. Some of you are going to be able to run. You're going to be able to move and get a lot done. Move. You're going to be able to do so without getting weary. And he says, some of you are just going to be able to walk, but you're going to walk without fainting or collapsing. This is the image that he gives to us. In the 1960s and 1970s, there was an individual that gained a lot of notor notoriety among Christians. His name was Brother Andrew. 
Brother Andrew had a ministry of going into closed countries. At that time, communism and the Cold War was sort of at its apex. And he would go into cold, uh, these countries and he would come and he would try to uh, disperse Bibles in countries sort of like Russia where the, they were closed. They were not allowing people to bring Bibles in. And when asked about his ministry, Brother Lawrence, or Brother, I'm sorry, Brother Andrew said, I would pray, I would sense God leading me to a, a particular country, a closed society. My advisors would pray as well. And when I realized this was where God was leading me, I didn't often feel great boldness or tremendous courage. Rather, I was scared stiff. I didn't feel like God had suddenly infused me with a great ability or a great power of courage. But what I would do is I would walk in obedience down the road toward the border of that country with the Bibles in hand. And time after time after time, in the most amazing ways, the door to that country would swing open and God would find a way to get those Bibles into that country. God gave me the strength to do it, Brother Andrew said. The power to do it, the ability to do it, as I needed it along the way. It's sort of like a supermarket door, he said. If you were sitting in the parking lot at a grocery store and you look at that door, you could sit there all day and wish and hope the door was going to open as a result of you mentally wishing that it would open but the reality is until you get out and you walk by faith and you walk towards the door and the centers go off, the door is never going to open. That's basically the principle I've lived with all these years, he said. God is waiting for us to walk forward in obedience and to trust him so that he can give us the power we need to serve him and to do what it is he wants us to do. My friends, Isaiah is speaking to people that are tired and they are weary. And the Lord says, I will strengthen you. I will give you a power to do and to endure that which you do not think you can do and you cannot do in your own strength. Very briefly, there are five ways that I think we can walk towards the door. We can move towards the Lord. Even as we wait upon the Lord where we can move towards him and find that we put ourselves in a position to experience God's strength in our life. First of all, we have to trust him. We must trust the Lord. As Isaiah 40 says here, you know, we have to trust that God is going to strengthen us, that God is going to give us the ability to endure and to do what it is that he asks us to do. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, the following chapter says, do not fear, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We have to trust that God is able and willing to do that which he promised to do in our life. Second of all, we need to engage other believers. Sometimes God gives us his power and his strength, not by just zapping us magically through the Holy Spirit, but sometimes God strengthens us through other people, specifically other believers. As we draw near to other believers and we connect with them, we often find that God speaks to us, that God strengthens us and encourages us through other people. Three times in the book of Acts, the Bible says that the church was strengthened by the apostles. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 23, when David is being pursued by King Saul, the Bible says that David uh, and Saul's, uh, Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped David find strength in God. David found strength to persevere and to endure because Jonathan came and encouraged him. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, the Bible says, we sent Timothy, who is our brother, God's fellow worker in the gospel, to strengthen and to encourage you. The point here is that God often uses people to give us strength and power to move forward. Third, we should apply the basic laws of physiology. In other words, there are certain natural laws. The sun is going to rise in the east and set in the west. There are 24 hours in a day. There are certain things that we know are going to happen. In the same way, we know that there are certain things that we do to take care of our body, and there are certain things that we knew that hurt our body. If you don't allow yourself to get enough sleep, if you don't eat well, if you don't exercise, sometimes that affects our body and our minds. First Kings chapter 19, verse number eight, the Bible says that, that Elijah runs away after Jezebel threatens him, and the Bible says he fell down exhausted. And an angel of the Lord came to Elijah. And rather than just sort of speaking to Elijah or zapping Elijah with strength, the Bible says this in 1 Kings 19, 8. He got up, he ate, and he drank what the angel gave him. And it says, strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb. In Acts chapter number nine, after Paul had his Damascus Road experience, the Bible says, after taking some food, he regained his strength. 
Now, the point being this is that sometimes I think we can over-spiritualize things. And sometimes the Lord says there's very practical solutions. And so if we feel weak and if we feel weary emotionally, mentally, physically, sometimes we need to look in the mirror and we need to pray and say, God, is there something that I can do to better care for myself so that you can strengthen me to do what it is you want me to do and to go through what it is that you want me to go through? A fourth thing we can do as we wait upon the Lord is we can seek him in prayer. Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 9 says they were all trying to frighten us thinking their hands will be too weak to do the work. But I prayed, Nehemiah said, Lord, strengthen our hands. And God did strengthen their hands and they were able to rebuild the wall. Psalm 88 16 says, turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your servant strength. One of the things we can do is we can pray and ask God for strength and perseverance. And fifth, we can spend time in God's word. Psalm 119 says, my soul is weary with sorrow. Not just physically am I tired. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word, O Lord. Philippians 4 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Sometimes, my friends, God strengthens us through his word. He gives us hope and courage to move forward. The point being that in the Bible and even today, there are times in life where we feel like we just don't have the juice to do what it is that God wants us to do. We feel like we just don't have what it takes to move forward. But the prophet Isaiah spoke and said, listen, God has a promise for you. First of all, remember who you're talking to. You are talking to God. Have you not heard? Do you not know? The God, the everlasting God who was and is and who ever will be. The one who created the heavens and the earth. He does not grow tired or weary. The Lord does not slumber and sleep. God, this God whose ways go beyond our understanding. We cannot fathom the Lord's ways. This God is able to strengthen you if you will wait on him. He is able to give power to you when you are weak, when you have nothing more to give. To the point, said Isaiah, that you can soar on the wings of eagles. You can run and not grow weary. You can walk and not faint. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul gives a prayer for the people at the church of Ephesus. And he says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can even ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's my hope and my prayer for us today. That God will give us the power, that God will give us the strength as we wait upon him. Not waiting passively, but praying, looking into his word, drawing near to other believers, trusting in him, and even taking some responsibility for our own life choices. And as we do so, I pray that we will see God's power at work in our lives and at work in our church, that we will find a measure of oomph, a measure of strength, a measure of courage, a measure of power to step in and to move forward in ways that we could never do in our own flesh. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you help us to trust you. And I do pray, Lord, that just as last week, Lord, I... I was so blessed by several stories and testimonies of people who shared their stories about your provisions, your providence being at work in their life. And I pray, dear God, that this week as well, that you, Lord Jesus, would provide your power to your people. And that you will help us, dear God, to find a strength that goes beyond our own. Whether our need is emotional, whether our need is mental, whether our need is physical. May your power be at work in our life that we may follow you, that we may serve you, and that we may endure whatever it is that you call us to walk through. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, today as we talked about God's power, his ability to strengthen his people, we now prepare to take communion and we are reminded during this time that God also gave Jesus the strength and the power he needed to fulfill his mission of giving his life on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. The Bible says this in the book of Hebrews, also talking to people that are beat up, people that are weak, people that are thinking about quitting. It says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that just as we have to endure situations and hardships, and even though we may feel like quitting from time to time, that Christ also had to endure. But God gave him the power, the strength he needed to endure the cross. And so today, as we gather for communion, we're reminded that the bread represents the body of Christ. The Bible tells in 1 Corinthians that in biblical times, you know, we often have individual cups and individual wafers, but in biblical times, they would have one loaf and they would break off that loaf. And in many cases, they would have unleavened bread like we had here, and they would break this. They would take it and they would remind the people that just as there is one loaf, one piece of bread, that we are one body. But yet, though we are one body, we are many individual pieces of that body. And so today, you are in your home, and you are sitting there, and people are all over this country, all over this world. We're not able to meet as we're used to. But today, as we take these elements, the body, the bread of of Christ, which, which represents his body, the cup, which represents his blood, we are reminded that we are part of the body of Christ, that we have been forgiven because Christ also endured. And so take the bread right now the bread that's before you. Let's say a prayer and let's express gratitude for the body and the blood of Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you that you endured the cross, scorning its shame, that we may be forgiven for all of our sins and trespasses. As far as the east is to the west, you have cast our transgressions. So Lord, we receive the body of Christ. We receive the blood of Christ. And we were reminded today that we, though individually sitting in our homes, are part of a larger church body made up of people that have received you as our Lord and Savior around this world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may take the bread. And eat. You may take the cup of Christ. The blood of Christ. Father, we thank you once again for the sacrifice you made for us, a sacrifice that displays your love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We pray, dear God, that we will receive the gift of forgiveness that you offer to us, that we will not bear the shame of our sin, but that we will walk in the freedom that only is available through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in his name we pray, amen. We are so glad you joined us today. It's our hope and prayer that this video worship service helps you feel connected to the Palm West family and is a blessing to you. Now, let me remind us of the job Jesus has for us. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God bless you.